All right. Sounds pretty hot. There we go. Good. All right. Here comes the weathers. Beautiful weather today. Eighty four. Beautiful. Hmm. There we go. Getting into the seventies. All right. Here we go, folks. We ready? You ready, bud? Get yourself ready, bro. Okay. Good to see everybody today. Hope you're having a great day. Thanks for tuning in to your Friend of Real Estate Update. Let us know your thoughts and everything else. Say them there. Hey, folks, welcome back to your Friend of Real Estate Update. I am Darren Ahern with Remax Results, bringing you over 20 years' experience in the Pennsylvania and Southern Maryland region and all over the place. Terry, I get a lot of people that ask me, like, can you do real estate here, there, and everywhere? And I said, yeah, I got colleagues and teams and people I know and, and uh, that I work with uh, for the last 20 years um, all over. And, uh, and then they're able to help our clients, uh, which is really, really nice. Kind of like what you guys do with mortgages and how you're able to help even out of our area and state and all that stuff like that. And he's sitting right here, the wingman, Mr. Terry Kearney. Hey, Notre Dame. All right. You Go got your Irish, hat on. Baby. He's going all Irish today. All Irish. Biggest mistake I made in the football pool NCAA thing I do with my whole family in Pittsburgh and other friends and everybody that we've done for the last years. And by the way, I'm in third out of 12th place. My teams are doing really good. But one thing, I made a fatal mistake and I did not pick. Like last year, I had that awesome team right now that everybody's talking about in the news. Colorado. Ooh, ooh, ooh. And I didn't pick them and my brother did. And so my brother's all about, you missed, you missed your prime guy from your Atlanta Falcon days. And so anyway, so we're not here to talk a whole bunch about football and everything like that. But I am a little, you know, it is pretty exciting to watch Colorado and what they're doing. And I just wish I had picked them. So congratulations to my brother out there who has them on his whole pool team thing and they're doing well. But we'll see if they can just keep it all up, those little Buffalo people. Well, it's yeah. It sounds like that the um, uh, Dion's kid looks like the real deal. Yeah, uh, and he's playing quarterback. Who's number two? But or number two or number three? But uh, it, but they've got some real studs out there. And, um, They're having fun. I, I don't want to play them. No, I don't want to play them either, but I'd love to go to a game. So, if anybody would like to donate a Colorado football game ticket for this year, I'd love to go see the Prime to coach those guys. So, all right, let's get right into real estate. Thank you guys so much for tuning in each and every week. Uh, we have great fan listener base. Appreciate everybody, all the buyers and sellers and everybody out there, um, Terry. And and, uh, and so, yeah, our audience has definitely grown and we have it out there. And so anything that you need from us, we are here. And today, Terry, that's one of the big subjects I'm going to talk about is the, um, the no-nos and yes-yeses for buyers and all that kind of stuff I want to focus on because, man, we have gotten a lot of questions with a changing market about protocols and can we do this and can we do that and all that good stuff like that and i'm sure you get that as well in the mortgage side because it's like weaving through a wild web of how are we going to take the best path to be able to help you get a loan and get qualified amongst the craziness of interest rates and affordability and all that kind of stuff like that so before we get into terry we're going to talk on the big subject that you have for us today that is probably one of the hottest topics in real estate right now in the mortgage and lending world and all that. But as far as inventory, we haven't done this in a few weeks and all that since I am now back from paradise, the fun side of the island. Uh, 5,000 miles away I was. I'm not going to tell anybody where I was. It was in a disclosed location and I got private tours of all kinds of good stuff. But I'll give you a hint. It's where Pearl Harbor is. So that was kind of an amazing 10 days to be able to see paradise over there. And um, yes, I'm looking at real estate over there. One one of these days when I can afford it, I would love to to snatch up one of those little places up there on the North Shore where they do all the <coughs> surfing and all the fun stuff. It was pretty unbelievable to see. Did you get some all the islands or any of the Yeah, islands? went over to the big island. We flew over for a whole day, got to see the volcano, which was active. It was erupting the day before, and we got to see all of it, and I got crazy pictures, and it was cool. Couldn't take the helicopter up and around the rim and all that. It was just way too much lava starting to flow and smoke and 
everything and but it was pretty impressive to see and then of course the waterfalls oh my four and five hundred foot drop waterfalls were just absolutely amazing and some of the animal life and the rainforest kind of settings and it was totally different than uh, the big island was different than oahu oahu is um very populated if you think dc 495 traffic is bad go hang out in honolulu no joke 5 30 in the morning six lanes each side bumper to bumper for 10 miles i about lost my mind really? i was like take me back to white sand and emerald green water and get me off this asphalt highway stuff oh yeah, it's more unbelievable and i asked my buddy i said why is it like that and he said because the six hour time difference and everybody doing business for the east coast Nobody shows up at work over there at 9 in the morning. They're all there by 7, 6.30 and 7 because it's already 1 or 2 o'clock over here. Okay. So, Makes yeah. Sense. So, I'm thinking everybody leave and go surfing at noontime then, for goodness gracious. Come on now. So, it was a great, great time to see my buddy. He actually works in the Honolulu um, Remax office over there. And I got to see two of his listings and one place he got sold while I was there and all that good stuff. So, it was really neat to see how they do business 75 percent of their buyers are cash buyers and their average home is about 1.6 million dollars <laughs> so they're in a little different world than we are it was kind of cool to see homes that are five and six million dollars up on the north shore there where the uh surfing is big all right let's get going here whole different world good stuff it was fun it was great and so i can't wait to get back so um, all right, check this out. Well, maybe, Terry, one of us, we can do a, like an all-expense trip paid. Somebody calls in with answering one of our questions. We'll go ahead and give you an all-expense trip paid to yes, Hawaii. Yes, you can do that? that. I think you can do that. <laughs> See how I'm trying to rope him on in there and all that good stuff? All right, here are the numbers, Terry. Right now, total total um, active homes for sale in Frederick County. We did it. We did it. We oh, broke 300. Wow. You've got to be kidding me. It's about time. It's only been 10 months since we've done this. So 307 homes, Your Honor, we have finally broken. And out of the resales, we've got 171 resale homes with an average time of 39 days on the market. New construction, 195 with the um, that we have going on right now with the uh, average single family sale premium price of 719. Coming soon, 35. Whoa, that number really went down. Uh, pending under contracts, 450, 195 new, two, uh, new 255 resales with an average time of 19 days. And in the last 30 days, sold 323 with an average time of 16 days. And the average single family price was 575 um, on the resales. But the brand new ones are 706, which has come down just slightly there. Hmm, little adjustments that we're seeing. And the list to sold price ratio is 100.9% and holding very, very, very steady. And so, Terry, what I wanted to do is go back one year ago, turn back the clock, 365 days. At this time last year, we had 408 total homes for sale. And right now we have 307. 100 more we had last year at this time. So that's a 25% less homes for sale than we did even a year ago. So that's pretty significant. Um, the other numbers uh, from a year ago at this time that's really significant is we had um, 251 were resales, 44 average time days on the market. So it's up just a tiny bit um, right now, or it's in that same range. New construction 157, 54 coming soon. We had, so we had more homes on the way than last okay. year at this time. And the big one is the sold to list price ratio is 99.6. Now, Terry, somebody's going to say, wait a minute, a year ago, 99.6 today it's 100.9 um i thought the prices i thought the market i thought everything's changing and we've kind of flattened out this just shows that a year ago some of the changes that have happened but we're just kind of flattened out it's almost like we don't know which way the squirrel's going to run here it's like being in the middle of the street you're driving down the street you see a squirrel and you watch him go back and forth for a second it's like well, i don't know which way he's going to go and um and we're trying to dodge that too so those are some of the numbers terry what are your thoughts so one question is: Last year they had 400. We had four, over 400. How many were new construction last year at this time? Ooh, now he's getting me pinned down to granular data. I love it. What? Oh, 157 brand new homes at that time was uh, on the market, and we have now 195. Yeah. So that 195, just as a reminder to everybody, that 195 is about 60 higher than normal. Right. Yeah. Yeah, it is. Mm -hmm. So, so which means that a lot of builders are pushing. Um, you're starting to see more and more builders pushing 
to try to clear out the inventory and try to get that down. So that's one of the reasons. So that's a big difference in the new construction. The other numbers seem fine, days on the market. Um, but getting over that 300 mark, I think, is very, very important. Uh, we've seen a slowdown in demand. If you if you pick up a newspaper, if you, oh uh, yeah, you know, it, it, you don't have to go very far to figure out that the demand for a mortgage right now is the lowest it's been in 27 years. Oh, okay. uh, yeah. So think about that. We're talking 1996, 27 years ago. That's when the last time demand was this low for. Uh, for mortgage applications. So, um, yeah, those numbers uh, don't shock me at all. The coming soon doesn't definitely does not shock me because there's not a lot going on. It doesn't seem in the market right now. Yeah. And a lot of people, Terry, are going to be wondering, and I know this, uh, it's just natural to think this. You just said something really interesting that in the last 27 years, this is the lowest amount of demand for mortgages right now. And yet everybody would say, well, why in the world is the, um, the average days on market still around, you know, 40 days or so? And certain price points, it's even less. And higher price points, it's higher. But we're not even at the average. We're not even across the board. Why is that still taking place? And that's simply because of one thing. It's just because... In retrospect to the amount of inventory that we have for sale with the amount of population, the buyer demand is still exceeding the inventory. And so until our inventory starts to go higher, 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 and buyer demand kind of, let's just say, Terry, it stays where it is now. It doesn't increase. The only thing that's going to increase it are either prices going lower or interest rates going lower. And we're not seeing neither of those things happening, right? And so because we don't see those things happening, buyer demand is at this level where we're at. But Terry, if we had not 307 homes for sale on the market, but if we had an average, what we normally average, a thousand, we would be in huge trouble. There is absolutely no doubt about it. If we had a thousand homes for sale right now, mm -hmm. we would not see 20, 30, 40 days time on the market. It would be like a hundred days on the market. And we would see prices every single month decreasing much like we were seeing for the last three or four years that we were seeing prices increase every month by, um, you know, a margin and such like that. So those are the numbers. That's the comparison of a year ago. That's the that's what's going on right now, that it's kind of flat in, in most regards and everything like that. Um, Terry, I just had a seller I just met with uh, yesterday again. And their place is uh, across from Spring Ridge on the other side over there, Bartonsville Road. And there's two bedroom, one bath, small, cute little place, great condition. You know, it's like 850 square feet. And they were saying, hey, is, is our price, you know, is it better to wait until the springtime to sell our home? What do you think price is going to look like? And I said, well, nobody has a crystal ball. But I said, I can tell you this, your home price is uh, below the rent floor, we call it. It's like your mor a mortgage for that at 7% interest rate with somebody putting 5 or 10% down. You basically, or almost no money down, is basically a rent payment. And so that's the rent floor, we call it. And so anything above that, we don't know. It could, it could, we could see a little bit of an adjustment um, if interest rates continue to go up. There's no doubt that's going to put a lot of pressure on values to now start to even level out even more, flatten out, plateau, or actually come down and say get one, two, three, four percent of um, in that particular price point of value adjustment downwards. Uh, and so, uh, and I told her, I said, look, the chances of that happening with your price points pretty slim right now from what we're seeing. Um, but but you never know. I said, we'll keep an eye on it. So they're in the middle of deciding, are we going to sell? Are we going to stay? What are we going to do? And I said, the bottom line is there's a higher probability of of different things shifting even more so negatively than becoming more positive in the next six months. Um, but we have talked about the fact that next year is an election year, and therefore we may see interest rates start to come down little by little in 2024 at some point to start to make uh, allow things to be more affordable and look better for the elections for next year. So it's anybody's guess, you know. So, all right, Terry, those are those numbers. Um, I'm going to hit some national fu uh, fund numbers real quick here, and then we are going to get into assumable mortgages because this is probably the most um, amazing thing that somebody can do. In fact, I have a buyer right now that asked last week, um, Darren, is there a way you can send me a list of all the homes for sale, Montgomery County, Frederick, everywhere that are assumable mortgages? Can you send those to me? Because like, that's what we want to buy. I was like, wow, haven't had that request. I'm trying to figure out how do we find those. And uh, those are qualifying in VA, right? Assumable mortgages, VA primarily. 
And we're going to talk about that today, Terry, because I need your help as a, as a, as a lender. All right. Um, here's a good thought that came out this week. Keeping current matters. This is probably some of the best data nationally. I have the whole packet here. It's like 80 pages. I will be willing to send this to you for free. All I need to do is hear from you. And I do post it on my website, DarrenAhern.com. Every month that gets posted as well. And it's the latest and greatest, uh, some of the best information out there um, and all that. So it says most agents know what's happening. Good real estate agents understand what's happening. And great agents can explain what in the world's happening. Terry, I hope I'm explaining things well. How's that? <laughs> so... All right. Um, the next thing that came out were like home sale things here, Terry, real fast. There's so much here, but existing home sales receded 16.6% year over year um, across the entire USA. And of course, this page says in the Northeast, it was negative 23.8%. And so a lot of that, I think, was driven by the fact that in the Northeast, we have some of the higher price points, you know, New England and the whole Northeast. We're a little bit higher than um, the South and some of the other areas in the United States that didn't see values go up quite as much in the last three years. And so what goes up faster comes down faster as well, typically. And uh, and, it, and and that's de a derivative of also how the, um, the kind of demand that's in those areas, like how many people want to live in this area of the country versus others. And I've told you guys in the last three years, I have never helped so many sellers in all my life move to like Myrtle Beach and the Carolinas. And I'm like, what are they giving away for free down there? You know, and so and in the south and in the west and then the south was the lowest number, negative 14 point. 3%. So that kind of made um, some of that kind of sense like that. As far as inventory, it said average uh, average annual inventory of homes for sale uh, as of right now was 3.3 months. Um, our area, we're about less than a little bit less than of around, around one month or so of inventory, maybe 1.2. It's climbed up to at this point. But overall, we are far from the five months that is a balanced market. It's not a seller's market or buyer's market at that point. And that, and that fluctuates just a tiny bit. Single family home units that um, have been completed, Terry. This was interesting number that came out. 14 straight years below the 52 year average of units that are being built and completed. And they're just now saying that we just are hitting the average annual units that are being completed per year built brand new homes. We're uh, actually, as, as across the United States as a whole, we're right at that average right there. And so therefore, what they're saying is we will not, if we stay at this pace, we won't see a housing shortage at some point in the future. But Terry, in our area, we know that the demand for new housing is exceeding uh, still a little bit of what's being built, and that's and that's in our particular area. So there again, these are national stats versus more local. We're going to give you, but it's nice to compare both to see what's going on uh, with both of those kind of numbers. Real real quick, today's home uh, owners are staying in their home uh, for an average of nine plus years, and from 2010 to 2022, for the last 12 years. The tenure in a home was 9.3 years, whereas previous to that, from 1985 to 2009, the average family stayed in a home 6.1 years. So obviously, I think that 9.3, Terry, is actually going to grow even more. I believe the average is starting to get up towards 10%. And I'm not saying that because I've been in my house actually now 10 years. Um, so there you go. I'm above the average already. So the longer I stay in my home, the more above the average I am. So that's uh, interesting to know of how long people are staying in their homes. And then we look at the dynamics of like, why is that? A lot of it right now is simply because they have a 3% interest rates. And who in the world is going to give up a 3% interest rate to go fetch a 7% interest rate or more? So, um, but that's going to shift and adjust and change. People are going to, obviously, I tell you, is, is they're going to have to at some point, job changes, life changes, getting older, you name it. Something's going to basically... Uh, bring more and more and more people that are in home ownership to a place where they're going to be more viable to, 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 to not be as concerned about the interest rate thing, more so that their life changing and life things and their life needs and goals and desires are going to exceed that number. They're going to, it's going to replace that number at some point and such like that. So, all right, Terry, there you go. Those are my thoughts on some of the cool numbers and trends and things that so many people I know are really, really interested about. So let's get over into assumable mortgage land. Let's go. Okay. So um, 
So what I want to talk about was basically uh, assumable mortgages. Mm. Why? Because I'm starting to get calls. You're starting to get calls. It's becoming a hot topic. There was an article out about a company, a mortgage company, that is going to deal with just assumable mortgages. And it doesn't make sense to me because let's talk about what an assumable mortgage is. The reason we're talking about it is rates are at seven and a quarter percent. Rates feel like they have to come down or should be coming down, but they're not. They continue to stay above seven percent. As long as they're above seven percent, we're going to see a uh, slowdown in demand. We've already seen it. It will continue until we can get down to under seven percent. Is my feeling again? Yeah. So, what is an assumable mortgage? Basically, an assumable mortgage is a financing arrangement where by an outstanding mortgage that a seller has can be transferred from the current seller to the buyer. So that eliminates me, that eliminates the need for a, a mortgage company. So what does it do? It basically allows somebody that in today's environment to buy a house from the Smiths and the Smiths have a 3% interest rate, and they're going to come in and they're going to assume that mortgage. So the first question is, wow, that's great. How do I find them? Well, there's three types of mortgages out there that can be assumed. Number one is a VA mortgage. Yep. Number two is an FHA mortgage. Mm -hmm. And number three is going to be a USDA loan. Okay. okay. All right. So those three mortgages, they're all government-backed loans. No okay. conventional. No Zero conventional convention. loans can be assumed. No conventional loans All are right. assumable. So, yeah. so take that off the table. Let's talk about what you have to do. So if I'm going to have somebody assume my home and I have a VA, if that person comes in, biggest thing is they always say, well, I'm not a veteran. You don't have to be a veteran to assume a VA loan. You can actually assume a loan from a veteran and the veteran loses their ability, benefit, their their benefit to buy another home with the VA loan. Okay. Okay. If a veteran assumes from a veteran, then they just transfer the VA eligibility from the seller to the buyer. Okay. 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 So it's easier and cleaner if a veteran is assuming a loan from a veteran. Okay but you don't have to be a veteran. Um, the biggest thing is liability, okay? So when somebody says, well, I want you to assume my loan. So let's take a look at one scenario, which is probably gonna be average for this area. Okay. So an FHA or a VA loan, USDA loan. I don't know a lot about USDA loans. My guess is that's gonna be a little tougher, but let's talk about a normal loan. Somebody uh, has a loan that's three years old and they bought the house for $300,000 and they bought it on a VA loan and they now want to sell it for $350,000, right? Okay. So let's say that they go for $350,000. What you have to do is you have to contact your current mortgage and they have to basically get you to assume it and they have to qualify the buyer so the buyer has to get qualified through it's through, through the, the mortgage, mortgage company company and yeah through va okay? yeah both yep mm -hmm. so you have to basically coordinate it and if it is not done properly then you can't settle and if you let somebody just take your mortgage over then you're still on the hook <laughs> if it's not done correctly you are still on the hook okay yeah so the biggest thing is that um is that you have to basically qualify for the mortgage that is there. Now, the big question is, is well, you only have a $300,000 mortgage, so can I go back to the mortgage company and keep that rate and raise the loan to three hundred and twenty-five to help me cover the cost? The answer is no. You're assuming the yeah. exact mortgage with the exact terms, with the exact rate. Wow. So... If somebody's been in there three years, you only have 27 years left on that mortgage. But the biggest thing is your mortgage payment is so much lower than today. Oh, yeah. So that comes to 
how do I get it? What do I need to do? Yep. What you need to do is you need to have some money available to you, either your own money or putting a loan on that property. So I'm a buyer. I'm going to buy from you, and I'm going to assume your loan and your loan's an FHA loan. You're going to sell it to me for three hundred and fifty thousand. The balance is three hundred thousand. I need to come up with fifty thousand dollars. If I have enough money to write you a check, no fuss, no muss. All is good. We basically do the arrangement. We go to settlement. It's taken care of. FHA's on board. The current mortgage holders on board, and I write you a check, and then you walk away from the settlement table with your proceeds. Right. No yeah. No what happens if, which is going to happen a lot with these VA and FHA assumables, what happens if I only have $10,000 to put towards that $50,000? Oh, yeah. I have to go out and I have to obtain a second trust mortgage. Okay. okay? So can that be a home equity line of credit? That Yes, that can be a home wow. equity line of credit. Didn't know that. Okay? It gets... Uh, it's not as clean a deal, obviously, because no. you're relying on the home equity line to come in and basically be put on your loan, and it's put in the second position, and the uh, and it's a little tougher because there's more qualifying that has to go on. Yeah. So the easiest thing really is is bringing your own cash to the table, getting a gift from a family member, mm -hmm. doing something that brings that gap closer. Now, you still have to qualify, okay? So, one of the biggest misnomers that you find is, I want to assume this mortgage. Can, can we just do this mortgage? Can you have him assume this mortgage because he has bad credit? Ah, okay. ooh, that's a good question. Is this a way around bad credit? No. Ooh. Do you think the new mortgage company is going to want somebody with bad credit assuming a loan from somebody with good credit? Absolutely wow. not. Makes sense. So, so things like that isn't really going to benefit you. If somebody doesn't have good credit, they're probably not going to be able to assume the home. Okay, so you got to have the down payment. You got to have that. But that is something that more and more people are asking about, and it's going to become more and more popular here until the rates start to come back down. Yeah. Okay. The other thing that we're seeing away from the assumable mortgage that is becoming a factor in buying homes is the student loan debt is starting to have to get repaid in October, okay? Yeah, right. That's gonna put a lot of people in a bind if they have a $300 a month student loan debt. Right. Now this whole time that they've been in forbearance, yep. we still charge that debt against them. Oh, you did? Yeah. That still was counted still, in the factor? Still factored. That in makes that. sense, okay. Okay, Yep. because we didn't know that when it was gonna be, you know, coming out. So uh, student loans, those are coming back. So um, I've gotten a huge amount of calls on the Maryland Smart Buy program, which basically gives up to $40,000 forgiveness on the student loans. And we're getting more and more people that are saying, okay, now I'm serious about having my student loan debt paid off because I don't want to pay the $300 a month or whatever it is. Yeah. So uh, any questions on the assumable? Yeah, the big thing, Terry, um, I didn't know about the, <laughs> the, the qualifying and all that stuff like that. But um, so I guess the, the biggest thing people have to understand is that it's true. You have you can't like if I find a buyer a uh, home and it's an assume. Oh, how do you know it's assumable? How does it like do you just is it possible to just say, well, it's a VA, FHA or USD alone? They're all assumable. Correct. Out there. Correct. They are. They all assumable. Yes. They are. They're all assumable. So if they're all assumable, then then that's the way it should be advertised. And, and it's just a matter of finding a qualified person. Then they have to still go through all of the um, the, the qualification process. Is right. that qualification process? And this is the last question. We got about forty five seconds. Is that is that process to assume a loan and be qualified for it? Is it harder than if it's a non assumable loan? Here's where it's harder. Okay. okay. Yep. Here's where it's hard. To assume a loan, a lot of times the mortgage company, the holder of the mortgage is going to drag their feet. There's a lot of hoops you have to jump through. So it's harder from a, can somebody help me get this done? Kind of thing. It's not like a 15-day turn. Okay, not at all. So now we got to go so farther. So people don't with want 
to deal with assumables, but okay. they have to because yep. all the VA, FHA are assumable. Cool. All right, guys, thanks for tuning in to your Frank Real Estate Update. We will see you next week. Call Terry and I. We're here to help you out. There we go. Good seeing everybody. Take care. Make sure you uh, let us know any <coughs> cares, thoughts, questions, and concerns. We're going to take care of you. Good seeing everybody. That's on there. Thanks. Years of combined experience.